Well, good morning. Now, the writer John McKay once observed how Spanish families would often retreat at the end of the day from the busy streets to their balconies where they could look down on the world, the hustle and bustle below them. Or they could gaze up at the stars far above them. They ended each day with a different perspective by getting a God's eye perspective on the world. When life hurts, we have been walking through the Old Testament book of Job for several weeks now, exploring answers to the problem of pain and suffering. Not so much answers as we have been considering different perspectives on things. How are we to think about our pain, our world, our suffering? Does God care at all? The writer C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, once wrote, he said, the human spirit will not even begin to try to surrender self-will as long as all seems to be well with it. When the world bends to your liking, to our liking, he says, when our bodies and brains do as we want them to do, we remain untroubled. And untroubled, we're able then to believe that all is right with us and God and with the world. We're in charge. We don't need to bow to God. It suits us just fine since bowing to God is one of the last things that any of us want to do. Who wants to surrender their will and submit? It offends our pride. And so what does it take, would it take, for God to get your attention and to get mine? Well, Lewis goes on to say this. God whispers to us, in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciences, but he shouts in our pains. Pain, Lewis says, is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And as a dad of three small children, I appreciate the need of a megaphone sometimes to get their attention or just to get them to do anything at all sometimes. Pain and suffering is God's megaphone that he uses to rouse a deaf world, C.S. Lewis says. Disrupted plans, halted journeys, cancelled Christmases, pandemics, all of them remind us of life's frailty. All of them used by God to get our attention. And this morning I want us to consider the perspective on the world offered from the balcony of Christmas. In Job 37, verse 23, Elihu says, The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power. And yet, at Christmas, we remember how God came down from the balcony of heaven and entered the busy streets of life, the hustle and bustle of our world, experiencing our pain and seeing life from our perspective. For the past four weeks, we've heard three of Job's friends try to comfort him with different explanations for the terrible suffering and afflictions that he's experienced. Using visions and tradition and reason, each of his friends have gone to great lengths to try essentially to convince Job that all of his suffering must surely be the result of his own making. Surely, they say, he must have done something terrible to suffer in such a way. Maybe he lied when he was 17, or maybe he forgot to forward on that email that got sent round. Job, they insist, admit your sin, turn from it, repent, ask forgiveness, change your lifestyle, become vegan, start recycling, give up this pretense that you're in the right. Now, in chapter 32, we meet one more person who comes to Job to try to comfort him, Elihu. But Elihu's comfort isn't so much an attempt to explain Job's situation as it is a matter of preparation. Elihu comes to Job as a prophet, preparing him to meet God. Rather like how John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus to come and how the angel Gabriel heralded the news of his birth. This man, Elihu, prepares Job to finally meet with God. Job 
it seems, is about to get his wish. He's going to get his day in court and he's going to be able to present his case to God. You see, for chapter after chapter, Job has been protesting, much like we do, about the unfairness of the universe, complaining about the way that God is running things, his poor management, and soon, very soon, God is going to reply to Job. Now, Amy, my wife and I, we, uh, we rarely argue, uh, but there are a few pressure points in our marriage that are always kind of guaranteed to bring out a blowout of some occasion. And often, one of the things that causes this is a wedding, going to a wedding. You see, when it comes to a wedding, Amy prepares for days or weeks or years in advance by getting herself ready, by doing her hair, by choosing her dress, by putting her makeup on. I, by contrast, for the, the days or weeks and hours leading up to the wedding, don't prepare in any way. I leave things as, as late as I can, and then with 10 minutes to go, I throw on a suit, jump in a car, and often as a result, we are fighting traffic to arrive on time, getting there just as the bride makes her way down the aisle. When it comes to big occasions, like weddings or like Christmas, some of us are like Amy, getting prepared. Others of us, like me, leave things to the last minute, acting as though we've got all the time in the world, just relaxing, just want to enjoy life. Don't worry, it'll never come. We've got plenty of time until... Christmas Eve, we're out fighting people in the shops to get what we need. The fact is that all of us need to think about and prepare for life's tragic events before they happen. We need to find an anchor point to hold on to before the tornado hits. And the question is, how does Christmas and the meaning of Christmas help prepare us to suffer? What are the options available to us? as we think about how to cope in a crisis. Now, unlike our current moment, where the existence of suffering and evil is treated almost like a threat to Christian faith, making it vulnerable to criticism and doubt, early Christians actually made a point of pointing to the reality of suffering and hardships as being one of the main reasons why people should believe in God. In fact, drawing on the work of Luke Ferry and other historians, Tim Keller says this, he says, it is almost impossible to overstate the importance of the Christian approach to suffering for the success of Christianity and its impact on human thinking. The perspective, the perspective on suffering that the balcony of Christianity gives us is what made it so successful in the first place. And it's ultimately what can enable us to cope in crisis. And so before we listen to Elihu as he prepares Job, I want to ask us the question, what are the different approaches to suffering that people have taken? The existence of pain and trauma is not new to us, of course, and so we can take comfort in the fact that every generation and every culture has tried to prepare its people for, for coping with difficulty when it comes. Outside of Christianity, there are four main ways of dealing with suffering. The first is the position expressed most clearly by Job's friends and is the one common to religions like Hinduism. This is the moral response to suffering. In this system, bad things happen to a person as a result of their own wrongdoing or as a result of their bad karma. The solution to the problem of evil is to stop doing bad things and only do good. Good karma follows good behaviour. And the promise is that whether or not in this life, certainly in the next life, the good that you do will make an impact and give you a better life in the future. Till eventually you reach the point of being absorbed into the universe and losing your identity altogether and be at peace. This is the moral response to suffering. The second response to suffering is a response common in the Roman world of Jesus' day and known to us through religions like Buddhism and philosophies like Stoicism. This is the response of detachment from life's troubles. Detachment, where people are taught to care less 
about the things in their lives. In this way of understanding things, the pain and suffering that we face is a result of our misplaced desires. And if we can change the way that we think about the things in our world and the things in our lives, we can reduce the pain and suffering that we experience until ultimately we become enlightened and understand that there is no suffering after all. It is an illusion. And so it was once taught that in order to reduce one's attachment to the things of this world, when putting your children to bed, one tutor taught his students to, to kiss their children goodnight and then afterwards whisper to yourself, tomorrow they will die. As a way of reminding yourself to not hold on tightly to the things in this world. Love less, attach less, desire less, and you'll suffer less. Live in the moment, meditate. Practice mindfulness. Don't hold out hope for the future. Train yourself not to care. Keep a stiff upper lip. These are all ways of trying to cope with and minimize human suffering. Reduce desire. Care less. The third and similar to this approach is the approach of fatalism, where people are taught and trained simply to accept whatever happens to them as part of the will of the gods or of the universe or of Allah. Expressed most clearly in religions like Islam, individuals are taught, inshallah, if God wills, it is the will of Allah. And they're taught, therefore, to endure hardships, just believing it is, accept what is. And in the end, good will outweigh evil in a big battle between the gods, or God, or light, or the force and darkness, like in Star Wars. So, we have those first three, the moral solution, the careless solution, the accept it solution, and finally there is the, pro the approach perhaps most common to us, which is the approach of secularism. The first three, common in more traditional societies, differ in some key ways, but all of them believe that suffering at least has the potential for purpose and can, in fact, add meaning to our lives. That ends when we come to the approach of secularism and what it says about our pain. In the way that most of us are trained to think about the world and about suffering, suffering and pain is only an accident and a result of living in a world as meaningless and as senseless as this one. Life hurts. Deal with it. The universe does not care, nor is there any larger or fuller purpose behind the universe and certainly behind your pain and suffering. Biologist Richard Dawkins says that life is empty, pointless, futile and insignificant and that to insist on trying to find meaning and purpose in our suffering is infantile, childish, grow up. All that matters in this view is the improving of our techniques to alleviate our suffering and so one day create and a utopian full society where there is no suffering that we cannot manage. I enjoyed this cartoon I saw recently. Upon news that a vaccine has been created for COVID-19, the couple say, hooray, we could now die of something else. Life is meaningless, death is inevitable. These are four ways of preparing ourselves for pain and suffering. Behave better, learn to care less, try to accept it, or just work hard to remove it. For Job, none of these solutions seem to help him. For starters, he hasn't done anything wrong to deserve suffering, and so he's not convinced that just by behaving better he can solve his suffering. Secondly, he can't just accept it because he believes in justice, and he believes that ultimately God is just. Neither does he believe that trying to care less is the solution, since he believes that God is loving. To care less is to love less, which doesn't seem right either. And fourthly, taking the fourth approach, he might want to, of course, fix it, but so many of the problems that he's experiencing appear to be beyond his control and outside of his power, creating a vaccine isn't enough. His problems have come from a spiritual source, something that's outside of the world of men, beyond his ability to fix it. And so what is Job to do? Well, Elihu comes to Job and says essentially, buckle up. 
brace yourself. Prepare to meet your maker. He prepares Job not by wrapping up presents and putting them under a Christmas tree. He prepares Job by firstly giving him a picture and vision of the power and majesty of God. He changes Job's perspective on himself and on the world. This is what Elihu says in uh, Job in his description of God's power. He says, At this my heart pounds and leaps from its place. Listen, listen to the roar of his voice, to the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He unleashes his lightning beneath the whole of heaven and sends it to the ends of the earth. And that, after that comes the sound of his roar. He thunders with majestic voice. When his voice resounds, he holds nothing back. God's voice thunders in marvellous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. He says to the snow, fall on the earth, and to the rain shower, be a mighty downpour, so that everyone he has made may know his work. He stops all people from their labour. The animals take cover. They remain in their dens. The tempest comes out from its chamber, the cold from its driving winds. The breath of God produces ice and the broad waters become frozen. He loads the clouds with moisture. He scatters his lightning through them. Elihu puts Job in his place. He reminds him how little he knows about the world and how little he controls and how mighty God is in comparison and contrast. This is the starting point for making sense of suffering getting a proper perspective on ourselves. The book of Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Elihu then goes on to say this, whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. God has his reasons, Elihu says, sometimes to train us, sometimes to care for the earth, sometimes because he loves us and love is his motivator. Suffering can be God's way of getting our attention. It can be his way of teaching us. It can be the consequence for bad behaviour. Or it can be the price of just living on a planet like this. A planet that is, that is constantly moving tectonic plates on top of a sea of molten rock and lava. In a world where there are over 100 million viruses per milliliter of water in a lake. All of it could be because of that. Just the consequences of this world. But it could also be, he says, because of love. Because God loves you and loves me. Now in the early first century AD, an altogether new and different approach, a fifth approach to the problem of suffering burst onto the scene and emerged in the world. Ideas never before thought of or embraced a view that ultimately came to outdo and dominate the other four perspectives. So that we now criticise Christianity and criticise what Christianity brings us about its approach to suffering, but we do so within the house of Christian thought, the way that it shapes the way that we think about death and life and the world and suffering. It was a view that gave people and gave us reason to hope. And it offered enough comfort to people that they were willing to go to their deaths, nursing sick people suffering from the plague in a way that no generation had ever done before. It was a perspective on the world that was born out of the event of Christmas. And it was a perspective that ultimately overturned the world on Easter Sunday. It was a perspective that came from the belief that death is dead that death has been overcome. You see, God came down from the balcony into our world. It's what we're preparing for. It's what we're celebrating when we remember Christmas and we import that story into our celebrations. God came into the world. He came into the world to live the perfect life, the life that we could not have lived. He died the perfect death in our place for our sin. But then on Easter Sunday, he rose to new life. And it was that historic moment and fact that turned the world upside down, that caused followers of Jesus to start saying, hope is here. 
There is meaning and purpose in your suffering. But we know that God also cares about you and can be trusted. And that we know that things will get better because death is defeated. Jesus is alive. Therefore, upon death, you don't need to just hope in a reincarnation until you eventually become absorbed into the universe and you lose your identity. Therefore, the, the things that happen to you, as chaotic and as painful as they are, do not come from the hand of an evil God, but from one who loves us and who sent his son for us and who died for us and who's alive again. It gave us an entirely new perspective on things. It lifted us out of the world to see things from God's point of view. Easter Sunday transformed that. Our five perspectives then, and our five approaches to consider the problem of pain and suffering as this. There is the moral approach, that we must behave better. There is the approach of detachment, whereby we need to learn to care less and be attached less to the world. There is the approach of fatalism. Oh, we need to just accept it. Then there is the approach of secularism where we need to learn to fix it. And then finally, there is the approach of the resurrection where we need to learn to listen to God, to trust God to use it, and to believe God that the best is always yet to come. It is the fifth approach that came to dominate the world. And it is the fifth approach that offers you and me hope in the midst of our suffering. So as we celebrate Christmas in a few days' time, let us allow the perspective of Christmas to inform the way we see the world. That this world is not meaningless. That the pain and suffering that we experience is not the result necessarily always of our wrongdoing. And that we don't need to just have a stiff upper lip and get through it. We can trust God in the midst of our pain and we can believe him to make a better world on the other side of our pain. Amen. God bless you and happy Christmas.